Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our uh, listeners all over the world. I'm Barry Muller, your host of the RevAmp podcast. Today, I have Brianna Yarborough, the Revenue Operations Leader, um, as our guest. And today, we'll be speaking about finance and RevOps, the connection there, some of the charts that we create in there. Brianna, tell me what else, tell me some more about yourself. Yeah, a little bit about myself. I've got quite the diverse uh, background here. I, I started out in oil and gas being based out of Houston, Texas. It was the ultimate sort of go-to. That's where everyone ended up. Um, after uh, some time, I figured out it was not the place for me and ended up in tech, never looked back. Um, but in those experiences, you know, I did a little bit of procurement and supply chain and, you know, systems integrations, very high scale, you know, Ariba and SAP, SAP uh, S4 HANA implementations. And so that gave me um, some critical uh, skill sets that I kind of took along with me as I move, move forward in my in my career. Um, moving over to tech, I, I started to do more of a strategy and operational role. I was doing more people management and um, headcount planning and um, thinking about sales targets and thinking about um, uh, how many people we needed on the floor for a particular um, effort that was going on. It, it was ethical hacking. So it was a little bit different from just kind of like jumping right into Bob's. And so it took me a little while to get over there. Um, and then and after that particular experience, um, I immediately went into financial planning and analysis. I held three roles. Um, I actually was a one person show with some contractors and some peer support, meaning they worked in other departments, but they supported my initiatives um, for FPNA, business intelligence. And, um, and uh, oh my goodness, what is the third one? Um, it has escaped me. Um, revenue operations. I built out the entire revenue operations function. I can't, I'm like, how can I forget that? I built out the entire revenue operations function did not exist beforehand. Um, but I, my role initially started out as BI and FPNA. Those things were two things that were so closely meshed together that, you know, I had to collaborate with everyone in the entire organization to understand the state of the business. And um, what really was not understood from a leadership level was that we needed to be looking at this across our buyer's journey, have KPIs categorized for each of these areas. And that's how we started to build up RevOps. And that's how it became a part of my title and things that I, I would do for the organization. So that's a, that, that's a touch I'm more than I'm sure that you care to, to hear about my background. <laughs> no, that, that was excellent. No, thank you for that. And that um, helps us understand your background to um, so that we understand the finance and RevOps connection. So I love that. Yeah, uh, thanks for absolutely. introducing yourself. And our listeners probably, uh, you know, but our listeners don't know. Um, I'm actually also from Houston, Texas. So it's nice to have a Houston guest on the show uh, for the first yeah. time, probably. So yeah, go uh, Houston, go Texas. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, I think it's like, it's something like this. <laughs> yeah. Houston, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Houston house. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, Barry. You yeah, should yeah. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, hit me up if you, you make a visit. I know things are kind of crazy right now, but would definitely love to meet you in person if we, if we ever got the chance. Yeah, absolutely. I would appreciate that and would love that. So thanks for the invite. Um, cool. So let's talk about finance and RevOps. What, where does finance and RevOps even play? Very general yeah. question, but I think we have to start general. Yeah, absolutely. So finance is your best friend in revenue operations. Um, with, with my role currently, I'm responsible for sales forecasting. So I need to understand how we've performed in the past and how we're going to perform in the future based off of any trends that I'm seeing and anticipated growth that we, um, you know, obviously want to communicate to the board and our stakeholders that have some sort of monetary financial, you know, connection to ASAP. 
Um, in addition to that, I have to build all of the you know, processes that go around it, all of the tools that we set into place. And then we have to be very intelligent about our data. And so the, the intelligence pieces, are we capturing the right information to support being able to uh, put together these board decks that finance has to present to um, you know, our board of directors? And, and that, for example, is, is one of the things that, you know, is often a disconnect. Uh, RevOps and sometimes, you know, in, in organizations that I've come into, everyone's sort of siloed, they're working with their head downs, they're not collaborating very, very, very much. Um, at a previous company, that was, that was exactly the way that it looked. And um, because of that, you know, finance had different numbers from what sales had, and we don't have a single source of truth, and we need to build that single source of truth. And the only way we're going to do that is one, communicating, <laughs> and two, um, this is the BI part of it, building integrated systems that automate the work that we are currently doing manually and are officially sort of just kind of making a more efficient process for us all. And we don't have to, you know, number crunch over in Google Sheets or Excel. We can start to do our forecasting, um, you know, within our systems, but that is a, a journey and a path in itself. And so I, I would certainly recommend, you know, the first focus of the relationship with finance is building trust in each other and, and, and knowing that you're not working against each other. They, you know, it being in the sales department and being in a finance department, finance can, you know, bark at you a little bit and say, well, why didn't you meet the number you said that you were going to meet? Because now I have to go and tell so-and-so that this is where we are. <laughs> and then in sales feels like, you know, an order taker. And so, you know, you have to build a dynamic of this is a collaborative effort. We're all on the same team and let's work together to figure this out. Um, and that has where I, that's been where I've seen the most success. And I do that. I would say finance, um, even though they're not a part of what we what we always see as the revenue operations framework or organizational structure or anything like that, the the FinOps function is definitely a part of the equation. And we should think about including them more um, right next to, you know, enablement insights, sales ops. CX ops, marketing ops, all of the ops, <laughs> um, and, 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 and doing more of a collective target planning or OKR session or um, alignment session in, in deciding and moving in the same direction so that the company sees more growth faster. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. So let's talk about why do you think FinOps hasn't been in the RevOps um... I guess, discussion as much? What's the reason? You know, um, having having sat in finance for a while, unfortunately, um, the, the FinOps role is something, well, first of all, finance is not a revenue generating uh, or part of the organization. So they are the, the last to get head count and often last, you know, they have to make do. And so that's why I was a, a one person team with contractors because I reported into the CFO. Um, <laughs> and so that's one thing. And the, the other part of it is, you know, with, with the types of companies that I've been working for, we're often in the middle of you know, building out board decks or going through audits or um, going into fundraising efforts. And guess who has to do that? You know, we do. We have to build all of those, th all of those things. And so um, I think that, you know, a prioritizing a financial operations role would be significantly helpful to organizations as we think about organizational design and structure going forward. Um, and in not having it be overloaded onto, you know, a singular person, because that, you know, sure, we're, we're all wears as many hats, but sometimes we've got to hold on a little bit because it, it, it's something you'll break at that point. There's too many hats. 
we, we've got to actually be thoughtful about our budgeting and headcap capacity planning and, and knowing where the value and return on investment will be seen um, instead of, you know, throwing it all into the product or throwing it all into um, the sellers, which is what we normally see in, in startup environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, okay, cool. So then FinOps is important. We've, we've uh, definitely established that. The, um, let's talk more about the, you, I think it sounds like you're currently doing it, automating some of the forecasting. What's the, what's the FinTech stack, if you will, uh, for forecasting? Maybe that's also considered uh, sales ops uh, forecasting. So maybe help me uh, prior to understand, is it sales ops, is it thin ops, if it's it's um, forecasting? Yeah. And, and then uh, what's the stack, the tech stack for that? Yeah, unfortunately, it is different. I have not seen, at least today, a system that is, uh, you know, truly built to sustain sales and financial, you know, reporting needs. Um, I have or like forecasting from that perspective um, and perform, performance management. Um, but, but what the tech stack typically looks like in my world is finance has an ERP. Their ERP is their single, you know, their source of truth. It is integrated with our, you know, Salesforce instance, for example, and we can nestle um, you know, there's a database associated and we can nestle on top of that a BI tool that connects all of the information. Um, other systems are included. And so if you use, uh, our company currently uses Monday.com, for example, if you're using a, a Monday.com or a gain site or any sort of CX monitoring or um, or on the other side of things, you want to import your product analytics so that you can see things that attribute to variable revenue, then you can see all of that pipe up into this business intelligence tool. It's SciSense, uh, Tableau, uh, Domo, uh, things of that nature that, that would effectively build a dashboard that you need to see. And you can have one specifically for the board. You can have one specifically to understand how we're performing from a sales, um, a sales point of view. Are our current customers, you know, uh, coming up for renewals at time to start reengaging them? Um, you, 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 you have the information that you need without sort of having to go into the CRM and dig around for it or, or have an unnecessary meeting that uh, you would typically get the conversation going to understand this, you know, what we call business reviews. I mean, you could just go and look at this information and ask questions or, or it, it, I love it when you can collaborate in a system and you can ask the questions right there and, and, and that's it. Um, and then obviously Slack is a huge part of our business. And so we do a lot of collaboration there. And, and, and so obviously that's an important piece of the tech stack. And um, we are working on trying to get uh, a better way of sharing information between, uh, you know, Salesforce, for example, and Slack, because we do so much communicating over in that, in that arena. And so they apparently are working on a, a new integration. I'm excited to see what that is all about and hope that it'll fit our needs. But, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of under, other companies that do the same the same sort of work. And so I won't name drop those. Um, but but yeah, in the perfect world, it's an integrated systems, BI on top. Everything is talking to your data warehouse. They've got unique identifiers associated with them. We know which contract belongs to which contract. We know which interactions belong from a product analytics space to you know which contract we can do billing on time, we can do so much, yeah, I mean, there's so many things faster. We don't have to wait for a report or we don't have a lag time. It's, it's real time data right there in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really the BI is gathering all the data from different um, places. So it's not just grabbing from Salesforce, but also the ERP and also other um, places that the data is yeah. stored. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It would be wise to set it up on every system you have that's within your RevOps stack. Mm-hmm. Marketos, um, the Marketos, the game sites, the, the list goes on and on. And I, I always forget what systems we use. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a long tech stock tech stack and a, and a big wonderful diagram of all of the, the things that we're currently using but but yeah I mean connecting those to a data warehouse having them stored and um, using that information to create the dashboards that you need and um, not having to think twice about it you know later, yep. later on it takes a lot of manual effort when you don't have sustainable practices that create efficiency in the, in the future mm-hmm Yep. And so I just looked, ASAP has uh, less than 400 people. Is that mm-hmm. common to find ER- ERPs at startups that aren't like more than 500, 600 people? Yeah, um, we, we've we got NetSuite. Um, I had worked for a company that had more of around 100 people and we were evaluating ERPs. Um, and even if you don't have an ERP, um, there is a way to do workarounds with QuickBooks, which is typically the go-to start startup framework, at least in a capture money moving in and money moving out. Um, and in, in uh, it, any other form of, you know, data that you would normally have, like for, for example, the forecasting metrics, um, via API data, you can effectively include that in your BI report and um, and make sure that it's up to date. The same way that you can import and connect Salesforce to Google Sheets, for example, um, you can do the same thing with a, a BI tool. You just got to do it in the right way and make sure that you know your data is is correct and it's not optimal. It, it, it's better if it lives within a system so that we can leave out the margin of error from you know. Being humans. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. The, that whole human pe- people, <laughs> they're hard. <laughs> um, so let's give me, again, this is, I think, a little basic for you, but may, I think it will help me uh, picture a bit better. Um, what are two or three examples of things that would go into your ERP that you couldn't put into Salesforce, for example, or your CRM? Yeah, um, two or two. Let's see, two or three things that will go into the ERP. Um, y- you want to know? Uh, let's see, it would go into. Let me think about this because there's there is some duplication. I think that the ERP is mostly about holding the one contract values and then any estimated variable variable um, variable aspects. Um, and, and, and inclusion of, um, you know, the billing cycle. If there's a, a contract that's been decided, does that dis, does that contract have an out clause? And at what point does that out clause? You know, what date is that? So that we can pay attention to those sorts of details. Um, while we could create fields for this information in Salesforce, it truly lives in the ERP system. Um, and, and, you know, when I say rolling up into BI, you know, having it at the company level and seeing, okay, so they are in a contract for, and it is a sharing of information, obviously across departments, because you won't as a salesperson get access to the ERP or as a customer experience person, you don't have expectations to get access to the ERP. But, um, but I think the most important details that fall in there are the nuanced contract information that is respective to that particular um, engagement. And so um, outside of that, the, the second would have been what I mentioned, the billing aspect. Has the invoice gone out? Has it been paid? And then also just kind of forecasting into the future, depending on if you if you purchase that product, in which you should, um, the the ability to forecast your financials based on the frequency of which you have incoming clients and any sort of trending that the system is finding in that aspect and then being able to you know spit out certain things like uh, 
uh, this is this is you know our CAC, for example. We we're using ERP to not only bring in client details but operational details about the way that the, the company is spending money, and so it, we want it to be able to tell us how we're performing, and so it should be able to calculate specific details around you know, how much did it cost to actually land this customer? How much time did we spend here? Um, if you are more advanced and, and don't have a, a product team that'll fight you on it, it's wise to do some timekeeping so that you really understand the cost of sell and your profit margin. And so those are the sorts of things that you would anticipate seeing from an ERP. Love that. Um, I think you could work for an ERP company and do sales for them. I know. So. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've dug. I, you made me. You made me pull it out because I haven't been in an ERP in a, in a little while. But um, but I, I, you know, my my focus right now is completely around you know just forecasting, headcount planning, enablement, and doing all of that 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 fun stuff. RevOps, real performance management process systems and tools, stakeholder engagement, data intelligence. And so we're working on building out our roadmap and our plan for how we get to, to this golden state that I've shared with you today. But at the same time, that, that ER piece is important. It has to be set up well, and it has to, it has to know, you know, how are we spending our money? Where is it going in and out? And how are we, you know, tracking on the contracts that we're currently engaged in? Mm -hmm. Cool. No, I love that. Um, and it's really helped explain it to me and I hope also to our listeners. So thank you. Uh, we, yeah. we only have three minutes, but there's okay. something we, we touched base before the call or before the record, I pressed the record button and I did not, ha I should have pressed the recording button sooner, but something we <laughs> talked about, um, was something that you're passionate about. Um, at, for our listeners, we're recording this a day after Martin Luther King uh, Day, maybe MLK Day. Maybe there's something that you can tell, you can share the audience that you saw on LinkedIn, um, stuff that you are, um, you know, topics you're passionate about around this topic. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly, I think in the last, you know, couple of minutes that we have here, the, the highlights of the conversation that we had earlier is, that um, we can't find the people of color to fit the mold in, in these roles or they don't have the experience or et cetera. I think it's a cop out. Um, there are many uh, resources, Power to Fly, Jobwell, Trabaja that will, that are specifically designed as recruiting boards so that diversity recruiters or recruiters that um, companies or recruiters that care about um, having a diverse workforce utilized. There are also communities that, um, you know, hire Black, that's one of them that specifically has a program where um, recruiters can provide support on, you know, resume building and how to, uh, uh, you know, be an ally or how to provide some mentorship to people of color. And that that is the sort of thing that we need. Um, and, and then outside of mentorship, there's a whole new concept, concept sponsorship. There's none of that happening. We don't have you know, a, a buddy of ours that we went to uh, that we went to college with that wants to pull me into his company, or a, a buddy's kid that he wants to point to a manager position. We don't get that, and so think about how you could possibly advocate for people of color in in new ways, in different ways, in. Um, and, you know, create more empathy around the impact of the way that you, you, you move in your organization. It's not just the bottom, you know, the bottom line, which is revenue, revenue, revenue. It's also about people. And we need to understand that people first drive better results and it's higher motivation, higher productivity, but you've got to start with the people first. And so um, I implore people to check out the, the three companies that I mentioned, if you're looking for diversity hires and, you know, look at your metrics, what is your, your percentages? How, you know, how many people fit into certain categories, gender wise, race wise, et cetera, and, and see where you need to focus your time and energy. 
create ERGs, people like safe spaces where they can talk amongst each other and really connect and bond over um, their experiences or lived experiences at work and how they can make it a better place. And so I'll leave it with that. I yeah. can say a lot more though. But. Yeah, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't do, uh, I didn't give, it was really unfair for me to have you wrap that up into three minutes, but you did. And, um, and so thank you for that. I'm glad I still had the, the, um, <laughs> the Hebrew term or the Yiddish term is chutzpah, the disrespect to ask you to wow. summarize that in three minutes. Uh, but I appreciate that. So thank you for that. Um, it was so awesome meeting you. Uh, I think we'll have to do this again. Uh, either Absolutely. record offline, onla- online, um, etc. cetera. Uh, I wish you uh, luck with ASAP and uh, with so all much. the rest of your endeavors. So looking forward yeah. to continuing to be in touch. Absolutely, Barry. I have, I, I've had a wonderful time with you today and I will really anticipate uh, hopefully being able to do it again on another topic. And so thanks for having me and it's been a pleasure. This is fun. Perfect. Awesome. Talk soon.